Great. Uh, welcome again. And we're delighted to be uh, joined uh, to hear uh, a briefing on UNESCO's flagship education report. Uh, we're joined by, as I mentioned, Dean Brooks, Rajika Bandari, and Nanette Kelly. And I think, uh, Dean, you will start. So you have the floor. Certainly. Thank you. Um, just to say that uh, I really enjoyed uh, the chance to, to go through this report in detail. It's something that INEE has, um, many of our members have contributed to this report, for example. Um, and I think it's, it's a topic that's so relevant, actually, to what's happening, uh, especially for uh, children and youth who face displacement. Um, I recently was in Rwanda and Uganda where I was able to see um, some of this inclusive education practice that the report talks about. And um, I found it uh, just personally so helpful to be able to actually make those connections. Um, but really, I think you know, a key message uh, for, for those who are looking at the report is that it really provides uh, the recommendations and the, and the, the kind of contextualized approaches uh, to be taken so that we can actually uh, respond to the needs of migrants and um, uh, those who have been displaced and forci forcibly displaced. Um, I know my colleagues will talk about, uh, I'm sure, how important it is that countries look to inclusion of education. And I think what is so key in this report is how it gives that very practical guidance on how to achieve achieve those aspirations. And I also really uh, recommend uh, recommend really looking closely at the sections related to teachers and the importance of teachers in all of these contexts and the role that they can play, but also that we need to invest in teachers' capacity building. Um, so, you know, teachers so often are are faced with uh, educating children and youth who perhaps experience trauma or have psychosocial needs. And so this provides, um, you know, real strong advocacy points that we need to, to support the teachers in that. And I think one of the key uh, messages that I found really important and something INEE hopes to take forward is the chance that um, education could actually the financing for education could be increased by up to a billion dollars. There's a BBC report today talking about how the remittance, remittance could actually, if they were lowered from 7% to 3%, as the SDGs encourage us uh, to look towards, it actually could bring in funding um, for education because, as the report highlights, it's, it's, um, the lack is, is so prevalent. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I know for myself, when I went through that report, I've highlighted page after page after page. I will be going back to that personally. I, I know that our network will be using this report consistently in our own advocacy messages and, and to raise awareness. Um, so uh, very, very um, excited to see the Global Monitoring Report pick up this important topic. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Dean. Uh, Rajika? Thank you and um, good morning everyone and uh, I'll add to what Dean said about the value of this report and uh, my organization the Institute of International Education and I have had the pleasure of working um, with the team in Paris that works on this report and I guess we sort of constitute some of the external exports, uh, experts that the, um, the report team works with where we bring in an external subject matter expertise on some of the topics, key topics that they're trying to address. So we were really delighted to see this year's issue focus on migration and the perspective that we bring to this report through one of the chapters is um, the very key role um, that students and post-secondary or tertiary students play in the conversation around migration. And it's a group that's um, not often looked at when we think about global migration issues, but in fact is really critical because the internationalization of tertiary education um, really drives skilled migration in, um, in 
many countries. And that's something that the report really draws out, the connections between how students and scholars and global talent moves around the world and how that's having an impact on, um, on skilled um, migration to those countries or even out of countries. So it's really sort of a pipeline or pathway issue. Um, so I'll take my two or three minutes to just um, share with you some highlights of what's contained in the report on some of these uh, issues and hopefully um, that will um, interest you enough to go back and really delve into some of the other key messages. Um, and one aspect is that even though we continue to see that most student migration around the world, most student flows are still directed towards Anglophone countries and some of the key destination countries, we are beginning to see some critical changes that are important to take um, account of. Um, and some of this has to do with the fact that there's increasing competition across the world where more and more countries are trying to attract international students or globally mobile students. And in some of these shifts, um, there's some interesting trends worth noting. One is the rise of Asian countries and a lot of intra-regional mobility within the Asia-Pacific region driven by um, um, consortia such as A um, APEC and ASEAN and others. Um, we're also seeing um, a real increase in regional alliances where many regions of the world now are trying to retain students within within um, the region. Um, and then one of the really interesting shifts is that traditionally um, student migration has often been from the global north, uh, excuse me, from the global south to the global north. But we're now seeing a, a real shift take place where there's much more movement between um, developing uh, countries and much more of south-south uh, migration than we've seen before. Um, in terms of what countries' motivations are for attracting uh, globally mobile students, I think they fall into a few key categories. One is educational and cultural exchange, which is not new. It's existed for centuries, where scholars and students have moved across borders to learn and to um, to um, to share their cultural knowledge. Um, another is that countries are trying to grow their knowledge economies, and some of this comes from growing their own talent at home, but also attracting global talent um, and in driving science and innovation. And last but not the least, in many countries, including the US, international students are a large source of revenue. As of the most recent estimates for the US, it's $42 billion that international students brought into the US economy. Um, last year. A couple of more points that I'd like to share in terms of, um, and this is a really important aspect, that we are seeing that countries around the world are using a couple of key strategies to try and attract um, international students. Um, one is the strategy of scholarships, and we see this in the case of countries like uh, China, which now, according to some of our data, is actually the world's top host, uh, third top host of international students, and occupies a really interesting place because it's not only the world's largest supplier, if you will, of globally mobile students, but is now the third top uh, host. Um, Another uh, strategy is a subsidized education. Again, we see this in the case of Europe and countries like Germany, which are also using a strategy of uh, language and providing um, entire degree programs that are taught in English and are attracting international students. And then the last factor, but not the least, is, this, is, is the skilled migration policy of many countries, where there's a direct, again, going back to the pipeline issue, um, a direct um, connection. Um, I do, uh, I want to conclude by um, taking the conversation back to students and migration and really what they're looking at and what matters to students when they're thinking about destinations. And um, we've seen that the international student migrant today is very focused on a return on investment in their education. Um, they're very focused on the quality of a higher education that they can obtain, and they're very focused also on what sorts of opportunities exist for them after they conclude their studies. And again, that's that pipeline into skilled migration. Thank you very much. Uh, and lastly, Nanette. 
Yes, thank you very much. Um, we really very much welcome this report, and it's uh, again a good reminder for all of us that the ambition of the 2030 agenda is, and especially the commitment to leave no one behind, also includes refugees who are so well profiled in this report, of which we very much appreciate. Just to put it a little bit in context from that perspective, we now have over 20 million refugees in the world today. Over half of them are under 18 years of age. Uh, they have left and experienced these children severe trauma, loss of home, loss of, com loss of family members, often having experienced very grave trauma. And they go into um, hosting communities, most of which are located in very low-income or middle-income countries that struggle to provide basic services, including education services, to their own. And we find them then they are out of school. And there are so many barriers for refugee children getting an education. Uh, it can be uh, the fees associated with education. In some countries, they're not included in national systems. Other times, it is uh, schools are far from where they're located. They don't have the means of transport. Other times, it's just uh, poverty. They need to work in order to, su to support their families. And yet, the impact of this loss of education, we call it a, a lost generation, really, is extremely profound. And if you look at the global statistics, they really are quite revealing. Whereas 91% of uh, primary school age children are in primary school, less than 63% of refugee children are. And that number gets even worse for secondary education. 84% of the global secondary um, school age children are in school, and yet just 23% of refugee children are. When you get to university, which you know is, is, is the place where you can really make the biggest contribution in terms of your future, co your future contributions to, to communities often, there are less than 1% of refugees are in tertiary education. I can't tell you how brutal that is for youth who have um, had to flee their countries after just at having finished high school or just close to finishing high school. It is so debilitating to find that there's nowhere then for you to go after that. The, um, there's also a disproportional impact on, on, on young, young women and girls. I think you can appreciate that. If you look again at the statistics, uh, for every 10 refugee boys in primary education, there are seven girls, and that number drops to four girls to every 10 boys for secondary education. There's a, a lot of pressure on girls to drop out of school when they reach a uh, secondary school age. But I have to also say the tenacity to get an education is extremely strong. Um, no matter where you go in the world, um, some of the most uh, depressing places, if you ask a family, and, and, and we do this often, we, and, and I have very clear memories of if, if I, I, one family in Lebanon who was living in an absolute hovel. They didn't have enough to eat. There was rain coming through their tin roof. Um, and I said to them, if we could do one thing for your family, what would it be? It was clear. It was they needed their children in school. That was the one thing we could do for them. That is echoed all over the world. Children who are playing in refugee camps with makeshift toys, pebbles, stones, you say to them, is there anything we could do for you? What would you like most? I want to be in school. And then when you ask them, what is it that you'd like to be when you grow older? They always say, I want to be a teacher. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a builder. So their aspirations for themselves always far exceed the means that are available to them. And these are really powerful reminders to us of what needs to be done. Things are starting to change, and that's reflected in the report, and we're grateful that that is. The sad thing about the refugee situation is the numbers are also increasing. So whereas we were able, international, all the partners together, the private sector, the government partners, the UN, were able to get an additional half a million children into school last year, the sad thing is another half a million were add, added to our out-of-school refugee population. But to leave you with some positive news, 
on, on the more positive side of things, we are seeing a growing recognition that the best way to have refugee children educated is to channel them through national systems, provided those national services, those national schools are also firmly supported in doing so. And that means channeling important investments, development opportunities to schools so that they can, as you say, improve teacher training, improve um, classrooms, and do the necessary reconstruction needed in schools so that we can lift the outcomes, not just for refugee children, but also for the communities in which these refugee children live. And that's something that is now well recognized. It's reflected in the Global Compact for Refugees that is making its way through the General Assembly this year, and we're very grateful for that recognition. We're also very pleased about how many private sector partners have come on stream very robustly to support the education and innovative technologies and means to reach those who are the furthest behind. So we have mobile tablets that are solar powered and collected, connected to cellular uh, networks, uh, you know, Google and Vodafone and, and companies like this, providing their real experience and, and, and expertise in order to for us to reach those furthest behind more resolutely. We have very interesting programs that are opening up globally that are also connecting university-aged um, students with online courses in universities around the world. It's a wonderful way to try to uh, reach the the um, tertiary school uh, population which uh, for which there is currently a yawning gap and then there are other online open education sources which provide opportunities for secondary schools uh, students which are also being expanded by us but with our partners to achieve youth so that it's not just secondary school um, coursework but also important skills and vocational training as well. These are a number of the ways of uh, moving forward. So again, thank you very much for the dedication of this report that has brought these issues to light and also set a very um, clear path forward. Thank you very much and we'll take some questions. Edie? Uh, thank you very much. I'm um, Edith Lederer from the Associated Press, and thank you on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association for doing this briefing. Um, I know that the statistics for the United States for migrant and refugee children are not good. And I wonder what your message would be if you had the opportunity to deliver it to President Trump at this time. I, I, Edith, I really can't speak to what the education levels are in the United States. We have our program in the United States, our office in D.C., and we'd be happy to, to give you those figures. Um, I'm, I just don't have them at my fingertips. Uh, I can say that, um, I, I, I would have to say that one of our primary donors on our educational program are, is, is the United States, and so a great shout out of appreciation to the American people and also the government that does fund our programs and enables us to do what we are doing around the world on education. But as for the specific enrollment rates of refugee children in American schools, I cannot speak to that, but I also am not sure of, of the, any systemic barriers that are preventing young children from attending school. But we can, we can get back to you on that. Yes, go ahead. Um, hi, thank you for explaining about the student uh, moving from south to south and in Europe also. So my question is, how about the United States? The student influx, is it decreasing? 
Thank you for that. That's actually a great question because we just released our new Open Doors findings last week. So I'd encourage you to look at our website to get all the details. And um, Open Doors um, is a comprehensive annual survey of the flows of international students coming to the US. And to your question on what's happening right now, um, it's a very interesting and mixed picture. Um, we are, on the one hand, seeing that for the third year in a row, the U.S. Um, has is hosting over well over one million international students from all, all around the world, and that that number has increased over the prior year. However, on the other side, what we're also seeing is that a lot of that growth is driven by the fact that um, students, uh, the numbers of students coming in, increased by a large percentage over the past several years, and some of those students are staying on to participate in the sort of work-study opportunities that I mentioned earlier, which in the U.S. is called optional practical training. But the newer flows of students have slowed down somewhat. So it's a, it's a bit of a mixed picture, but you can see a lot of the details on our website. Great. Thank you very much for the briefing. And Monica will now brief on behalf of the PGA. Thank you.